I wanted to begin by thanking Life Technologies for giving me the opportunity to present some of our research today, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in to the 24 hours of stem cells events that they're hosting. I look forward to answering your questions live, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time on November uh, 14th. Today I wanted to share some of the work that we're doing with genome editing to generate human disease models. Often when people think of human disease models, they think of using induced pluripotent stem cells to generate models for disease. This, of course, begins by identifying patients, getting a biopsy or a source of somatic tissue, and then reprogramming those cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. This is followed by differentiation of those cells into what many people would think might be the disease-affected cell type, and then phenotyping those cells to try to uncover the molecular causes of a particular disease. And while seemingly straightforward and theoretically possible, this process encounters many obstacles. Initially, of course, identifying the patient can be difficult, especially if the disease one wants to study is relatively rare. Beyond that, the process of reprogramming is fraught with peril. Not only is it difficult to do, it's time-consuming and expensive. In our experience, it can take up to six months and often costs around $15,000 per IPS cell line generated from a patient. Moreover, once you've differentiated the cell into the affected cell type, you're always confronted with what do you compare this to? What is the control cell line? Is it just a cell line from another individual that does not have the disease? Or is it from a brother or sister who's unaffected or perhaps uh, the mother or father who's unaffected? Given these variety of issues, we've tried to conceive of a new way that you might try to perform these, to these studies. In addition to these obstacles, there are other lesser known problems with using pluripotent stem cells in disease modeling. And these have to do with the variability among different pluripotent stem cells. These differences we think probably arise due to differences in genetic background, differences in epigenetic state, differences in the pluripotency or differentiation capacity of those cells. And by that I mean certain cell lines are more apt to turn into, say, for instance, liver cells than other cell lines, and that can actually skew your results considerably. And then, of course, there's some differences in the derivation techniques by which people make IPS cell lines, which may actually impinge upon their ability to do all of these things. So, for instance, one we're interested, as we are in my lab, in trying to understand the effect of a particular gene on cardiovascular disease. And this gene is linked to LDL cholesterol, also known as bad cholesterol. You might think of doing the following study, making IPS cells or pluripotent stem cells and differentiating them to hepatocytes or liver cells the cells that produce LDL cholesterol. And a mechanism by which you might measure cholesterol production, you could look at the apolipoprotein B particle, which actually carries LDL and its secretion from these liver cells. And in order to be relatively rigorous, you'd want to use a denominator to try to quantify that over the amount of liver cells in a dish. So you could use albumin, another secreted protein, which is just a marker of mature hepatocytes. So this ratio of ApoB to albumin would give you a good sense of how much LDL cholesterol these cells in a dish would be secreting. So to test the idea of variability among different cell lines, we took two very well-established human embryonic stem cell lines, differentiated them into hepatocyte-like cells, and just compared these two seemingly wild-type cell lines' ability to secrete ApoB. So as you'll note, their differentiation into mature hepatocytes as measured by albumin, albumin was actually quite different. You'll see that in fact, Hughes 9 seemed to make more albumin and that this was statistically significant when compared to Hughes 1. In comparison, Hughes 9 seemed to secrete far less ApoB, and when this was normalized for the number of mature cells, you actually see that the Hughes 1 cell line appears to have a two-fold increase in ApoB secretion as compared to Hughes 9, and these are totally and completely normal cells as far as we can tell. So given this variability, we thought that that might mask some relatively interesting disease-associated phenotypes. So we propose the following disease study, wherein you might take genome editing tools to develop the particular disease cell type you want. You begin first with a completely wild-type pluripotent stem cell line, whether it be a human embryonic stem cell line or a human-induced pluripotent stem cell line, and then create the mutation that you desire to study, typically by genome editing. Take these two essentially identical twin cell lines, except for the genetic change that you've engineered, and differentiate them into the particular cell type you'd like to study, in this case, again, the liver, and then compare them phenotypically. We believe that this strategy has several advantages. There's no need for patient recruitment. 
There's no need to quality control the pluripotency of the IPS cell clones because you're starting with well-validated pluripotent stem cells. It allows for studies of multiple gene variants side by side, something you could never do in a naturally occurring cell that you would take from someone. You might be able to look at disease causing as well as disease preventing mutations all on one genetic context. And then I'll make the argument throughout the course of this presentation that in fact it's actually much more efficient and in fact cheaper to use genome editing to create your disease model. The question now of course becomes what genome edit, how do you engineer the mutation that you desire to study? One we found that is quite effective in doing that is to use transcription activate, activator like effectors as DNA mining modules to actually engineer targeted uh, specific mutations in the genome. For those of you that don't, those of you who don't know much about tau effectors, they were originally uh, identified in the plant pathogen Xanthomonas. And what's really intriguing about the, this uh, particular type of protein is that it has these incredibly modular DNA binding uh, domains. Um, so modular, in fact, that you can sort of stack them together like Legos to make them bind any specific stretch of DNA you want. So each individual domain will bind selectively and specifically to a single nucleotide. So there's one domain that binds to an A, a domain that binds to a T, a, a domain that binds to a G and a C, and you can sort of stack them together however you want. When combined with an endonuclease, in this case the FOC1 endonuclease, you have the ability to target that endonuclease to a that nucleus to a particular region of the genome and create a double strand break. As many of you no doubt know, double strand breaks in mammalian cells are often healed by non-homologous enjoining. Non-homologous enjoining is an error-prone process, and thereby you can introduce small mutations, often termed indels. And if those small mutations actually occur in a coding exome in a gene, you can actually create a knockout. So that's how Many people use these types of genome engineering tools to create cellular knockouts. You can, use, you can also use this same double strand break to actually knock in variants or DNA changes that you'd like to study. This is by hijacking the other method that cells use to repair these breaks, specifically homology-directed repair, wherein the cell actually looks for the sister chromatid or the other identical copy of the gene and uses that as a template for repair. What you can do instead is flood the cell with a template of your choice, something with homology that actually creates a change. In the case that I'll talk about today, we flooded the cell with single-stranded DNA oligonucleotides that had a single nucleotide change that we wanted to introduce into the genome because it was associated with disease. We've, in an effort to make genome editing in pluripotent stem cells even simpler, my colleagues and I have gone to the effort of creating a plasmid library that allows you to assemble the tailings that you would want to target to a particular genomic locus in just a single day. And we've done that by making small modular domains that would bind any particular region or uh, base pairs that you can basically link together with this golden gate technology to make a talon that we would call the talon A and a second talon which you would call talon B, which would essentially uh, create the double strand break at the particular region. We've made these also to express GFP and RFP so you can actually identify which cells have received both talent pairs. So the process by form genome engineering in pluripotent stem cells is to deliver the talent A and the talent B to the pluripotent stem cell, typically by electroporation, fluorescent activating cell sorting for GFP and RFP positive cells, which we replate and grow at a clonal density. You can then pick those clones isolate DNA, and then do PCR screens and followed by sequencing to identify mutations. What's really great about this process is not only do you identify mut mutant clones, at the exact same time you identify wild-type clones that have gone through the entire process so are as closely matched to those mutated clones as possible, and you can expand them and use them for your studies downstream. This process we found was so efficient that over the course of six to nine months, we actually used talons to target over 16 genes and 17 loci, which we reported in Cell Stem Cell earlier this year. And today I'm actually going to tell you a quick story about two of the mutations that we created. First, mutations that knocked out the gene sortillin, or sort one, and a second set of mutations, one which is a knockout in AKT2 and the other one which is a knock-in to AKT2. All of these studies were actually did by a single very talented postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Chirong Ding. One of the other advantages of using pluripotent stem cells to actually 
try to understand the uh, gene's function is you're not confined to study it in a single cell type. Pluripotent stem cells have the ability to become any differentiated fully mature cell type in the human body. And in today's studies, I'm going to talk to you about sortillin functions actually in hepatocytes, adipocytes, and motor neurons. Previously, sortillin had been implicated by GWAS studies and a series of functional studies in mice to be involved in hepatic lipid protein processing, our particular interest in studying this gene. But studies had also shown in mice that it might function in the insulin response and glucose transport of adipocytes, as well as mediate growth factor-induced neuronal apoptosis. Key findings that had actually motivated our study of sortillin is, despite the genetic studies and some functional studies of this gene, there was still considerable controversy about exactly what its role was in LDL processing. On the left was data from a Nature paper, which one of my colleagues, Karen Musanuru, published, which had shown that when sortillin was knocked down in mouth hepatocytes, you actually got an increase in ApoB secretion or an increase in LDL in the blood. Uh, contradictory results were published by another group in the exact same year where they had made a sortillin knockout mouse, and in fact, they found that in the knockout mouse, there was a reduction in the amount of ApoB that was found in circulation. So given this contradiction in mice, we felt it was appropriate to actually try to study this uh, disease-associated gene in the relevant context, that being human especially since mice turn out to be very poor surrogates for lipoprotein processing that's relevant for humans, as they never actually get coronary artery disease, nor do they suffer from heart attacks. The strategy that we designed was to actually go in with a talon pair and target exon 2 of sortillin and a human embryonic stem cell line HUS1. Shown below the um, gene structure itself are the two regions that the talon actually bound to target it, and then the resulting clones and mutations that we got as a result of just a single round of targeting. We were able to identify three homozygous mutant clones that had created indels that were predicted to knock out the gene's function. To complete, in fact, knocked out the gene, we performed QRT-PCR, uh, quantitative RT-PCR, to look at gene expression, and we found, in fact, that we had almost completely abolished gene expression, probably likely due to nonsense-mediated decay. But more importantly, in the Western blot, you can see that we've also completely eliminated the protein expression in the knockout cell line. Now we were able to conduct the experiments that we were interested, thus essentially comparing wild-type uh, hepatocyte-like cells to sortillin uh, knockout uh, hepatocyte-like cells. You'll note that these identical cell lines, rather than having significantly statistically uh, different abilities uh, to become hepatocytes, actually made albumin-producing cells almost identically. Compared the amount of uh, ApoB they were secreting, we found that the knockout cell lines secreted about twice as much. Now recall when we compared cell lines that weren't identical twins, we saw a similar number. So without genome editing tools and the sort of consistency of a single genetic background, we may have never seen this change. We looked at a similar uh, ratio looking at a different unrelated protein, APOA1, and we saw exactly the same effect. Just to make sure, though, that in fact sortillin was causing this change, and it was our deletion in the sort1 gene that had resulted in the doubling, we actually reconstituted sortillin protein in our knockout cells to see if it rescued the phenotype. Shown on the left, of course, is the wild-type expression of sortillin the knockout, which has none, and then the reconstituted sortillin that we used by uh, using a dox-inducible lentivirus. Again, we differentiated all of these cells into hepatocyte-like cells, and you can see that they have equivalent amounts of albumin uh, secretion. And what we see, in fact, is that the reconstitution of sortillin completely rescues the phenotype of increased or elevated ApoB secretion by the cells, so back to wild-type levels. And make sure that this wasn't due to us Introducing any other mutations, we also made a knockout in a second cell line in a second exon and got the exact same result. So to summarize exactly what we found in terms of sortillin uh, mutations in human cells, as I mentioned previously, these knockdown and knockout experiments in mouse hepatocytes had contradictory results. We find quite conclusively that sortillin knockout in human hepatocytes shows an increase in ApoB secretion consistent with the genetic results in humans. We also found in studies that I wasn't able to talk about today that a knockdown in sortillin uh, or knockout in sortillin in human adipocytes actually abrogated glucose uptake, and lastly, that that knockout actually enhanced on survival. 
I wanted to tell you a second story today about a different gene that we studied, which was AKT2. And again, we studied it in two very interesting uh, cell types, hepatocytes and adipocytes. And the reason that that was a good place to study them is cell types AKT2 is one of the key signaling mediators of insulin. So AKT2 lies directly downstream of the insulin receptor and is thought to actually inhibit FOXO1 uh, in the nucleus, drawing it out into the uh, cytosol, so inhibit its nuclear function. In adipocytes, insulin signaling actually increases glucose transport into those cells and increases their lipid synthesis, whereas in the liver, what insulin signaling typically does is reduce glucose output from the liver cells and, again, increase lipid synthesis. A only identified mutation um, with a very rare disease uh, had actually found a patient that had a a mutation that changed a single base pair that resulted in an amino acid substitution from an E to a K at the 17th position. This individual exhibited hypoglycemia, obesity, and left side overgrowth. And as you'll note, this was originally published in October of 2011, and our study only took about a year for us to sort of follow up on it with genome editing. I would like to underscore if we would have tried to have done this in the traditional sense using IPS cells, and I would have contacted, say, the authors of this study and asked if we might get somatic cells from the patient, I might still be in the process of trying to fill out the IRB protocols to do that or getting a skin sample or a blood biopsy. And at best, we might have our first IPS cell lines coming off of the production line at great expense. Instead, we actually already know the answer to what this disease gene might potentially do and how it's... So, First of all, there was a question as to whether this mutation, which actually took a glutamate and turned it into a lysine, was a gain-of-function mutation. First of all, the loss-of-function mutations in AKT2 had already been seen to show the exact opposite phenotype of hyperglycemia and decreased body fat or lipodystrophy, whereas the mutation that was identified in the science paper um, actually had, of course, hypoglycemia and obesity. So we set out to figure out whether or not this was a gain-of-function mutation. In essence, we used the identical strategy to target that region of the gene with talons. And initially, of course, we made knockout clones just by allowing non-homologous in-joining to, in fact, in a terraphone process, to create mutations in this gene. And shown below are two different muta mutant clones for AKT2. And we took advantage of the fact that we could deliver a single-stranded DNA oligonucleotide with a single base pair change highlighted um, here in blue. Um, that would actually create the E17K uh, mutation in these cells, as well as a silent mutation which would allow us to use a restriction digest to identify the knock-in cell lines. And below is a gel that we screened to find these knock-ins, and you can see a couple of knock-in clones that carry now the knock-in mutation. And then we sequence to confirm that mutation. Again, looked at the protein expression in these clones, and as you can tell in our AP, AKT2 knockout clones, they make no AKT2 protein, whereas the clones where we've modified the AKT2 gene uh, to actually change the amino acid, they have an identical amount of AKT2 expression. Now we can do the interesting experiment of asking whether or not this is a gain-of-function mutation. Normally what would happen in wild-type hepatocytes if you were to stimulate them with insulin is that you would see FOXO1, this key transcriptional regulator of insulin signaling, be removed from the nucleus into the cytosol relatively rapidly after insulin stimulation. And that's exactly what we see here. At, z at the zero time point, you see that there's a, a large accumulation of FOXO1 in the nucleus of the cells, and after 15 minutes of insulin signaling, most of that has been redistributed to the cytosol. In the knockout cell lines, which are unable to respond to insulin, you see that even after insulin stimulation, almost all of the FOXO1 is still resident in the nucleus. In contrast, the AKT2 E17K mutation, even without any insulin signaling, the vast majority of FOXO1 is found in the cytosol, indicating that this is likely a gain-of-function mutation. We next investigated the consequence of these mutations on glucose production in hepatocytes. On the left, you can see our investigation of the knockout cell lines that have no AKT2. And in contrast to wild-type cells that are stimulated with dexamethasone and forskolone that produce a substantial amount of glucose, these are just off the charts. They produce glucose in twice the abundance, and this is not easily regulatable or turned down by uh, insulin um, because they're almost resistant to uh, the insulin signaling. On the right, we're investigating now this uh, constitutive active form of AKT2, and in fact, these cells, even in the presence of dexamethasone and forskolone, 
don't really produce any glucose because they're constitutively seeing this insulin signaling as a result of the AKT2, and so again, they're also insensitive to exogenous insulin. If you also look at glucose uptake in adipocytes, you get a consistent picture, which is essentially that normally in response to insulin, those cells would be taking up glucose. The knockout completely abrogates the ability of these cells to take up glucose as, as uh, measured by radioactive glucose uptake, whereas the E17K, even without any insulin supplied, and that's that light purple bar, they're already taking up so much insulin, it's beyond insulin stimulated, and insulin seems to make no difference. So again, um, indicating that this is likely a constitutive active mutation in these cells. We could actually explore whether or not this might uh, fundamentally be a cell autonomous process that would create the lipodystrophic or obese phenotype seen in the patients, and in fact, we have evidence that's consistent with this. In the cell lines that were knocked out for AKT2, you actually get less triglyceride storage, and in those that are constitutively active for AKT2, you get much more. Again, consistent potentially with the fact that the patients are obese. One of the from our studies is when we looked at what these fat cells were actually uh, doing in terms of their uh, signaling to their environment, they looked like they were massively inflamed, so that this constitutive insulin signaling that was going on in AKT2 E17K cells was causing the cells to actually tell the immune system that they should be recruiting macrophages, et cetera. As many of you know, this is often what's seen in a pre-diabetic state, which causes this low basal inflammation, which has been termed part of the pre-diabetic or diabetic progression in type 2 diabetes. And it's quite interesting that what we find in this dish, where we only have uh, stem cell-derived adipocytes, is adipocytes manufacturing these inflammatory cues, so potentially indicating that they might be the initial source for this disease the pre-diabetic condition. So to summarize what we found with this study of AKT2 is that in AKT2 E17 patients, we found that FOXO1 stays inactive, the hepatocytes produce less glucose, adipocytes take up more glucose, adipocytes accumulate more lipid, and then the interesting new finding was that the adipocytes appear inflamed. Of course, anyone using a genome editing tool that's going to create double strand breaks in the genome is going to be particularly interested in what might be the off-target effects or where else it might bind in the genome and create mutations. So we sought out to investigate this. I should remind you, of course, that talons are most likely to create these indels or small mutations, not single nucleotide variants. And of course, you can never be sure that your cells are truly isogenic or these identical twins as we sort of design the study in, a, in unless you've looked. The way in which we chose to look at this was to take several different clones, three sortillin knockout clones on the Hughes ba one background, one sortillin wild type clone on the same Hughes cell line, and then a completely different gene that had been targeted in the same cell line, and then the parental cell line and perform exome sequencing. What we surprised us considerably. What we found was that there were a number of single nucleotide variants that occurred naturally in these cells as they sort of grew in culture. This could either be as, a, as the result of them changing in culture over time or actually just revealing these changes as we clone the cells out. So we're getting individual clones from a population and each individual clone might have a small single nucleotide variant. When we Looked a little bit closer, there were actually only two indels that we had discovered, and neither one of these indels were anywhere near a predicted talon binding site, and in fact, they were in uh, regions of the genome where these types of indels had already occurred. I did want to underscore one of the single nucleotide variants that we did identify that had nothing to do with talon binding was actually in the dystrophin gene, and it's a known disease-causing mutation. So it is important that you actually look in the cells where you uh, are working to know exactly what the mutations are that they might be harboring, just naturally, of course. So to summarize, what we found here, or our interpretation of these results, is that you would need to generate multiple distinct mutant cell lines and multiple control cell lines with the tail and pair as you'll note in the studies that we showed before, we didn't find that in, the same, in, say, across three clones, you ever really had three mutations in the dystrophin gene. It was a scattering of somewhat random mutations as a, as a result of a single nucleotide variation. Or you can do the much more rigorous experiment in the knockout case of reconstituting the particular gene or protein you're interested in doing. Uh, so as a final conclusion to this section of the talk, I'd like to underscore that genome editing using the talent technology allows more efficient and rigorous disease modeling using human pluripotent stem cells. We found that sortillin decreases secreted ApoB from hepatocytes and facilitates adipocyte glucose 
and neuronal apoptosis. AKT2, E17K, this particular mutation is a gain-of-function mutation that causes hyperglycemia and obesity. We also discovered that at least the talons that we looked at had minimal off-target effects, but that there were actually significant clone-to-clone -clone variation, which argues for the use of multiple clones. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the new genome editing tools that are becoming available, and in particular, one of the new genome editing tools has captured many people's imagination, specifically the CRISPR-Cas system. CRISPR is an acronym for the Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, which actually occur in the bacteria that have this system, and it's part of their adaptive immunity, whereby they insert portions of the bacteriophage genome, which is later expressed and makes RNAs that guide, in particular in strep pyogenes, the Cas9 nuclease, to the DNA recognition that the RNA recognizes and cuts it up. So it's a set of molecular scissors that is able to go to a specific place in the genome based on an RNA guide. Um, very recently, both Feng Zong's group at MIT and George Church's group over at the Harvard Medical School have shown that this system can actually function not just in bacteria, but in mammalian cells. And so we sought to test whether or not it might be as efficient, less efficient, or more efficient than the tail and genome editing tools that we've spent so much time working with. We designed this experiment to essentially test tailins and CRISPRs at the identical loci that we had already used in the identical cells so that we could really feel like we were comparing apples to apples. And in essence, these tables summarize our results on the left are the efficiencies of uh, mutated clones that we found using tailins. And those ranged anywhere from 0% in the case of the LDL receptor, all the way up to, say, 33% for the GLUT4 gene, uh, or the glucose transporter 4. When compared to tal uh, the CRISPR-Cas system at the exact same genetic loci, it was an order of magnitude difference. The easy way to sort of summarize these results is to say that our worst CRISPR was better than our best talon. So on average, what we were seeing were knockout efficiencies or mutation efficiencies of 50 to 80 percent. And perhaps even more stunning was with the talons, we had very, very low, often as low as 0 percent uh, homozygous mutations that we found, whereas when we used the CRISPR-Cas system, we'd find efficiencies like, for instance, at the glucose transporter 4 or the GLUT4 locus as high as 25% of the clones recovered were homozygous mutants. We created the same mutation on both alleles as a result of using this system. So it was stunningly efficient. We also quickly investigate the off-target effects of these genes, or this CRISPR-Cas system, and so we looked at a few of the uh, loci that we'd, looked at, that we'd looked at before, AKT2, for instance. We found that the guide RNA that we'd used there had um, another target where there were two mismatches in the genome, and we will look specifically at that predicted off-target site, we found that there were no mutations in the clones that were recovered. On the other hand, one of the other genes that we had targeted, C6ORF106, had a single mismatch in the genome elsewhere, and we found that 4% of the time in the clones that we'd recovered, we actually found mutations at that site that was not the on-target site. And then sort of in the worst-case scenario in our hands, we had... Um, a single mismatch in a different uh, cell line where we basically had a single base pair mismatch and we saw somewhere between about a two-thirds amount of cutting with that single base pair mismatch. So it does indicate that this CRISPR-Cas system, while much, much more efficient, can also have the risk of having off-target effects. But we think that much of that is guide dependent and if you design your guides correctly, you might be able to find guides that, much like the AKT2, don't appear to cut anywhere else in the genome. To sort of in this, we're actually performing a similar analysis as we've done with the talons, where we're using a variety of sortillin clones, as well as another protein that we're interested in these days that we've called PICO, as well as the parental cell line, to do whole genome sequencing to do an analysis of both random as well as predicted off-target uh, analysis in the whole genome. I'd like to thank the people that made the work that I presented today possible. My colleague, Karen Musanuru, who really spearheaded a lot of the genome editing uh, efforts in the laboratory and who has his own laboratory that uh, is interested in uh, cardiovascular disease that's adjacent to mine. Chirong Ding, who's a talented postdoctoral fellow who really did all of the cell-based work that I showed you today, both around Sortillon and AKT2. Nick Kuvervasser, whom without we would not have the library that makes it possible for you to create Talons in a couple of days, and the many other talented members, including Derek Peters, Yule, Stephanie, and Leone. And of course, I, mu I must thank Feng Zong and George Church for giving us access to the CRISPR tech CAS technology early in the phases. And thank you all for listening today.